Hello everyone, welcome to William and the Magic Box. Today on our show, we are going to have Brad. Brad is from New York City in the USA. So let's see what Brad has to say. Enjoy the interview. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Brad. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Oh my God, nice to see you. Finally, I'm meeting you. <laughs> It's true. For some reason, I have heard a lot about you. I don't know why, but I, I heard a lot about you. <laughs> so Chris, Chris said, he goes, most of it was about you. We talked about, you know, and he did. We watched it and, you know, I mean, I, I know I wrote you and told you how much I loved it. You're, you're such a, an active listener and you ask really probing questions. And then, of course, that smile uh, and your energy just sort of lights everything up so uh I, we really enjoyed it i i know he enjoyed doing it and then we enjoyed watching it even more oh thanks so much thanks for the kind words uh when i when i read your message you just made my entire year with those <laughs> lovely, lovely words thank you so much sure. so how's your day been so far uh, i believe you're not in new york you are in fire island I, i'm on fire island mm -hmm. um and uh, uh i picked It's a really hot day and this house has no air conditioning because I was originally going to sit out on the patio with some nice view behind me. It's so hot out there. Um, and I, I'm in the living room with the ceiling fans going and a small fan going over there. And uh, I was like, okay, this is not too bad. You know, <laughs> it's just, uh, we're at that time of the summer. I see. And why Fire Islands? Why do you spend some time there? There is anything specific or you just like the place? Well, it's, um, there's two places that we love. One is uh, Provincetown, uh, mm -hmm. and that's like our Mecca, but it's too far from New York for us to get to it very often. So we just usually pick a week and go up there. Fire Island is very accessible. Um, there, it's a long, narrow sandbar of an island that you have to take a ferry to get to, so there are no cars here once you get here. So oh, wow. it, already it's more peaceful. It's such a narrow island. You have a bay on one side, it's very peaceful, and the ocean on the other, you can always hear the waves, and it's miles and miles of white, fine, sandy beaches. And and then it's, you know, it's a haven for for the gay and lesbian community too. There's the Grove and the Pines are the predominantly gay community. So it's very festive and creative, and here you see a lot of guys who are just expressing themselves in a non-binary way, um you know they're just m melding the you know genders and uh and it's just really cool and very creative so um and, and how cool. how far is from new york fire island well if uh if there's no traffic it's about an hour hour 15 minute drive mm -hmm. um of course you can have hours of traffic depending on when you go then the ferry is 20 minutes to uh, take you from Seville to the island. And then everything's walkable once you get here. And I always just feel like oh, my shoulders just drop and I hear the sounds of nature. And, you know, it's just with the craziness in New York, it's so peaceful to be out here. And since we're working remotely still, um, a good deal of the time, I'm like, well, we have great Wi-Fi here at the house, you might as well work in this nice place and then I can take our doggy out for a beach walk in between meetings you know oh, oh, beautiful beautiful Brent I know you are a TV producer yeah so tell me a little bit about your career how everything started um so I started out um well I was an actor in my 20s uh and I worked I'd say more than most I did pretty well but I could kind of tell as I was hitting 30, that it wasn't necessarily going to be sustainable. Um, I did go out to LA, my agent manager were bringing clients to LA and even less happened out there. I wasn't great at the whole networking thing. Um, but I did end up at Renaissance pictures where they do Hercules and Xena. And I got a job as the assistant to the executive producer. And so that was my first real exposure to making television, all the various steps. And, um, I came to New York not long after I met Chris and I was coming for a big job that just didn't materialize. Uh, it was going to be a gay cable network, but it, it, it was, this is pre logo. 
Um, and it didn't happen, but I ended up working in the production office. Uh, Sam Raimi was directing a movie. And from there, I moved to Sex in the City, the original Sex in the City. Wow. On, the pr on the production office side. And then they um, very wisely put me in post because they saw I was helping those guys out with various tasks. And it just really clicked. Like post is a great combination of a lot of skills that I love using. There's a degree of technical, there's a degree of creative. Um, when you're running a department, there's all kinds of like diplomacy. You have, sometimes you have to be political. Everything has to be carefully worded. You have to be there for your team, um, make sure they're doing okay. And basically create a healthy working environment so that the good creative stuff can happen. And I, I love doing all of that. My teams are always very happy, very satisfied. And everybody always says you guys are the A team. So it's gratifying. So I, I've done a whole string of big shows over the years, um, ranging from well, I did Career Eye for the Straight Guy the first time around too, but uh, I did uh, this show called Nurse Jackie on Showtime that was very popular and went on for seven seasons. Boardwalk Empire, Bored to Death, Vinyl, um, a bunch of one season things, usually all very high end and streaming still. Um, most recently, I did Fosse Verdon um, for FX and we got nominated for Emmys for that. So I became an Emmy nominated producer at that point. Hey. Nice words to have at the beginning of any bio, um, <laughs> except until Emmy award winning, but uh, Emmy nominee is good. And um, uh, most recently uh, I did Tokyo Vice for HBO Max and I'll be going back for season two in the fall. Right now I'm finishing um, a project for Netflix called Kaleidoscope. That's like an eight part limited series about a heist and the parts are interchangeable. The audience will be watching the episodes in different order. The episodes aren't numbered, they're named by color, and you get your information differently and the clues differently depending on the order that you see the show. So, you know, it's Netflix wanting to innovate and uh, see if they can get you to rewatch episodes. <laughs> so. My God, you do a lot, Brad. Yeah. You do a lot, my goodness, amazing. Yeah. Look, before we start our journey, William in the magic box, yeah. um, it's visible how much like can see so much, so many tattoos around your body. Yes. Let's, before we start our journey, so tell me, um, when you start your passion about tattoos, when you start uh, have some tattoos? Um, late in the game, I didn't start um, getting tattooed until just l under 10 years ago. And I had wanted tattoos my whole life, but could never decide. I was always thinking it had to be some symbol or some picture or something that commemorated something. And I did finally get a tree of life here with my Hebrew name. That was the one thing. But then I saw this artist named Peter Madsen uh, online. I was researching one of my projects and uh, under the guise of sacred tattoos, sacred armor. I, he does these big Nordic armor pieces on athletic guys, and I had never seen large, cohesive designs like that. My jaw just dropped, and I was like, how am I going to work with this guy? He's in Copenhagen. Uh, <laughs> but he did come to New York for some guest spots, and I worked with him then. Then he moved his shop to Barcelona, so I went to Barcelona a couple of times to get wow. in. But I would go for like a week at a time. And that way you cover a lot more ground. Uh, and this last, this uh, Ari just came in to say hello. Um, can I see it? I cannot yeah, see it. Yeah. Can I see it? Oh, oh, cannot see. Yes, I can see a little bit, not full. Yes, I can see now. Hello. Ari. <laughs> hello. <laughs> oh, it looks so chill, so relaxed. <laughs> She's so chill. She's just like, why are we not? at the beach, um, but she'll be at the beach soon. Um, the, um, I, I, what I was gonna say is I usually go for a week at a time, but we started legs. Uh, this was just a month ago. I went there for two weeks and I'll just show you a little preview. Wow. Wow. So that's halfway of the tattoo or? 
that's that is i feel like i was i was like kind of complete from the waist up and i had nothing from the waist down it was like a half completed canvas now i feel like i'm a three-quarter completed canvas i mean he did all of that stuff across the back where we didn't couldn't get to in the nine days of inking that we did nine days of inking over 12 days oh my god i will never do that again but but it was great we cut and sometimes two artists at the same time um or just exchanging so they could just keep going i mean it was intense um but uh we didn't do inner thighs and um we will probably do a little bit on the feet i'm not, oh. really look, not looking forward to that but just to have <laughs> it be but it all it all like it all ties in he plans stuff three years ago he did he did these bands that come down here and they right. just stopped now they they connect to a plate on my crotch which was that's the most painful area now um and uh, it healed quickly though and um all of these these stripes are all coming you know in in perfect alignment with him it's just really he's so amazing at using the architecture of your body the 3d canvas of the body and he hits every, you can see where what he's working off of the musculature the bone structure um he's he's just brilliant and uh i'm his canvas so amazing. it's an exciting thing people amazing. will say how many tattoos do you have i'll say one <laughs> one cohesive tattoo <laughs> not a bunch of little ones all right Brad are you ready to go on a beautiful journey through your memories in life and to share your point of views yes sure welcome to William and the magic box so this is my best friend the fun questions okay i'm just yeah. gonna play a song now just for us to move a little bit before the first question let's do it right Brad. um so before <laughs> we start the journey if there is a question that you don't want to talk about for some reason you don't want to answer always can change okay mm -hmm. okay first question for you is who was your first crush and why um my first crush real crush was in college uh a gentleman by the name of greg raffleson we were in the drama department together uh he was just physically beautiful but funny and goofy and very smart um and yeah i just fell head over heels uh with him and people really enjoyed seeing this together it didn't last a super long time in terms of the relationship um and that was hard but at the same time we stayed friends uh and he was just a great guy and it was college you know i was really just finding my sexuality in college so i was really having to go through a whole adolescence uh just you know late in the game because i was just so inert all through high school you know i just didn't have any crushes or heartbreaks or any of those things because i didn't connect you know um so that first crush made a real impression on me because when it didn't work out you know i was i was i was crushed but even that he was really sweet about so um and he's a great guy and we're still in touch today amazing and uh, that's when you you realized that you were gay or you know you knew already how long for a long period I, I, I definitely knew that I was gay. I kind of knew when, so I went to school at Stanford. I was born and raised in Des Moines, Iowa. Went out to Stanford, um, San Francisco Bay Area, circa 1978. What an amazing time to be coming out. But I, I had a sense of it when I went out to California, but I hadn't acted on any of it really. Uh, and then when I got there, I was just like, oh yeah, of course. And, uh, and so I, I, it, I think it was just because I was on my own, but also the first guy that I met at the gay, uh, and lesbian center, Nani Lundesser from, uh, Arkansas. He looked like just, he was blonde, muscular, you know, lumberjack shirt. And he was a psychology major. 
and he was uh, in grad school. He was like 23, so he was an older guy, so confident in himself and just so confident in being gay and everything. And that really made a great impression on me because I was like, oh, this is actually totally fine. Like I, I, it, I, I went leap years, you know, uh, in those first months at school in terms of self-acceptance and just joyful putting the pieces together. Like, oh, <laughs> I thought I was some weirdo. I had no idea there were others. And, you know, I mean, anyway, it, you know, it was, uh, that was a very formative time. That'd be good. Next question. Let's do it. Next question for you is, what makes you really angry? Well, our political system right now makes me really angry. I get just very frustrated at the, um, the polarization of our country and uh, the, the, the lack of uh, uh, agreed upon reality uh, between the two sides is really frustrating to me. Um, and I, I just, we have so many big problems in our world to uh, solve and um, we're not getting stuff done because people are just craving power and they're pulling politics and um, they're trying to take us backwards. And it, 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 it's incredibly frustrating and it makes me really angry. You know, the lack of being able to do any meaningful gun control, um, banning abortions, like taking us back 50 years. I'm just embarrassed. And we have this Supreme Court now that isn't at all what that that institution was intended to be. It's just power. You know, they're just political now. Um, so I, I, I'm frustrated because I feel like overall the people in this country are really good. They're great people and their views are not even being taken into account with these big decisions. Most people want sensible gun control. Most people believe there should be access to abortion, but there are other forces at work and, um, there, there's just a lack of empathy, uh, and caring for other people. And that frustrates me a lot. You know, we're all interconnected and, uh, you have to be able to care about things that other people are going through. I just don't feel like our system is really, uh, is really doing that. I, I had a few guests on the show from the U.S., Brad, and uh, most of them, they, they mentioned that the country is divided. Do you, yeah. have, do you think that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, it's so... Um, now, granted, it's a minority, but we have a system that, uh, you know, the Electoral College primarily, that gives states with less population just as much power as huge states. So that's frustrating. But um, you have two different information systems. You have one that's just, uh, you know, maybe watching CNN or, or, or CBS or NBC or whatever. And then you have the others that are in their little ecosystem with Fox News. And um, the views are so polarized. And that's why, you know, people worry about us having a civil war. I just don't know what that would look like. Um, but it feels like we're just pulling further apart. And uh, it's frustrating because I feel like Putin really saw our weaknesses, our racism and whatever, and they deliberately stoked that in the election in 2016. And that's how they got Trump elected. And then Trump really just amplified that with all his incendiary comments. And then with the Supreme Court justices and these rulings, it's like his rule is still continuing to affect us in a very big way. So um, yeah, it's, it, it's extremely frustrating. I do feel like we're polarized and I honestly don't know how that's gonna resolve. Let's hope for better days. Absolutely. <laughs> I will always hope for better days. <laughs> Next question. Now I can see why Chris likes dancing. He got a good partner around who likes dancing as well. <laughs> I love dancing. I love it. Next question for you is, if you could go anywhere in the world right now, where would you go and why? 
Hmm. What just popped into my head is actually Israel. Part of me, well, I'm Jewish. My whole family has gone to Israel um, as sort of a pilgrimage to, you know, the state of things. It's an, it's it's not a stable place in the world right now. So maybe that wouldn't be a great idea. But actually, I was like, yeah, that's something that was sort of on my list that just never happened. You know? I see. And you're saying that, Brad, about your family. Did, they, did they, um, they support you being a gay boy at the time growing up? Did you have the support? It, well, they didn't. They didn't really. I mean, I wasn't out growing up, and then I went to Stanford, <laughs> and was so pleased with myself for my self discovery that I just had to tell them. Thought they would be pleased for me too, and um, they were supportive, but they were unhappy. I mean, my mom cried. My dad looked down into his chat, and he said, "Oh, you're just going to have such a tough road ahead of you." And And he's like, oh, it's bad enough you're Jewish. You got to have the gay thing too. <laughs> and and it took. And then they only they didn't really have any contact then with gay community. It wasn't like now where there's so many shows and things with gay people on it. So they just had fearful thoughts. They my mom thought that I they had talked amongst themselves after I came out. They thought I'd been taken over by a gay Mooney cult, and that that it was all about you know, getting you to buy these books to give to your family so that they can become versed in loving someone gay. That was the book. I'm like, that's for dad. That's a really tricky business model. You have to convert someone to gay. So they buy the books. It was like, so it took about, I, I think 10 years over time, seeing the people in my life before they not only, uh, supported it and, but they embraced it. And, uh, My dad didn't get to meet Chris, but my mom did, and she she loves him, and and uh, yeah, they were great to me. They were great parents, but it was foreign to them. It took them a, a good long time. And um, all your family, they uh, since you moved moved away from Iowa, Iowa, Iowa they still yeah. live there. Most of them, they still back there. Most. Well, my brother and his, my parents, of course, are long gone. My brother and his wife have a home in Des Moines. Um, Their kids don't live there. They live in various parts of the country. My sister, um, who just passed away right before the pandemic, she she ended up settling in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and that's where we did our Thanksgivings every year. She did it like a family reunion. And all of her kids settled in Madison. So still Midwest. Um, so yeah, yeah it, it, I, I hardly ever get back there. I go to Madison every year for Thanksgiving, but I hardly ever get to go to Des Moines. And when you think about your hometown, the place where you grew up, what's the best memory that comes to your mind? Hmm. Oh. Um, the smell of cut grass, the green rolling hills, big tall oak trees. Um, you know, it wasn't like living in farmland or something. It was just like a beautiful neighborhood um sometimes i'd walk to school sometimes my dad would drive me um winters were terrible but you know it kind of made you hardy uh mm -hmm. people are super nice there that is a, a a thing and it has since gotten a little more cosmopolitan even a a nice little gay community uh which it didn't have when i was there oh wow. interesting mm -hmm. ready for another one yeah let's do it Before the next question, tell me what do you like the most about your job? What's the most enjoyable part of it? And of course, there's always a challenging part as well. What that sure. would be? Um, well, so I produce television, uh, as is Chris. And I think one of the most enjoyable things is, first of all, really uh, having your preferred team of talent, editors that you like working with, Uh, music editors, sound teams, visual effect uh, teams, um, composers. Uh, there's so many different elements, and you know, I've been in the I've been in the business en enough and worked on some big shows that I've accumulated a a whole um, group of people that I love working with that love working with each other. It pleases me to no end to bring those creative talents together. And then for my head creatives to provide basically the time and space and resources 
for them to do the creative work and get the show the best it can possibly be. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm very good at nurturing that, at managing all the personalities along the way, but also good at having my team have a good time, having still involved in their lives, invested in the work. And then when you get to that final product and people are thrilled, the show that I'm working on now, this uh, kaleidoscope for Netflix, they're now watching the episodes in a whole new light because we've got these beautiful sound mixes, visual effects, composer score that's really fresh and interesting. And they're just like, thank you guys, you have elevated the show so much. Um, and when you can get your ex executives to enjoy the show again, that's a real uh, feat. So I, I, I love all of that. I love all the collaborating with everybody. I love being the guy who has to make sure that everything fits into place, that everything is as it should be and delivered on time and reasonably on budget. And, uh, and then of course it's a thrill when it airs, you know? Absolutely. And what's the flip side of it? The most challenging part? The most challenging part, uh, is sometimes it can just be really political like anything. So, uh, there's levels of politics. If you have a, a network technically they're the distributor and if you have a studio they're the manufacturer so sometimes there's friction between those two then you have production entities who may have nurtured the product or the head creative and they have their ways of doing things and sometimes they're just trying to protect their creative and they're not participating in the way that is productive or helpful and um you just have to deal with the politics of it. Um, it's, um, you know, it, it is my least favorite thing. And I try to not, I try to just be adept at handling those things, but not get bogged down by it. But I would say that's definitely the worst aspect to it. And ego, sometimes you just have huge egos to manage and I have to manage up and I have to manage to the side, you know, uh, I still have to guide them, even though they're technically above my pay grade, uh, even with my execs too. Sometimes I just have to bring them carefully through the project. But then the flip side of that is when I'm successful at that, that feels great. And they're usually grateful for it. And uh, saying that, Brad, do you think that uh, New York is the right place to produce big, uh, uh, let's say, uh, projects in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Like Los, Los Angeles, New York is the place for it. Yeah. Yeah, New York is, I mean, there's a lot of production happening all over now because different states and, of course, Canada, uh, um, you know, Chris has just arrived in South Africa today to, to prep Warrior. They're shooting an 1880s San Francisco piece in Chinatown, and it's all built in South Africa because it's just less expensive to do these big sets and things there. So it, there's various places, but New York started this tax incentive program uh, about... I think maybe 20 years ago, because right when I started, that basically gives uh, productions a 25% rebate for any work done in New York. So it suddenly equalizes the playing field with LA and we have New York as a location and we've been building up more and more talent here. Um, so it, New York is hugely busy and there's, it's hard to get stage space because they're so busy. And of course, any New Yorker will tell you, you know, they're filming all over the place and sometimes that's inconvenient. But, you know, our city is the star of the story many times. Yeah. Very good. Next question for you is, where is the most exotic place have you ever been? Um, I would say the Peruvian Amazon. I actually did a, well, I did a, a trip, uh, uh, it was this very sort of spiritual trip um, with a group and a guide. And we did the whole Sacred Valley in Peru, like, you know, all the way to Machu Picchu. And there was a lot of really beautiful things. Then a smaller group of us went to the Peruvian Amazon, stayed in uh, the rainforest in this tiny little camp. And we actually did an ayahuasca ceremony with a shaman. Wow. Like, in the middle of the Peruvian Amazon. I was even, we did little um, canoe trips and I swam in this little tributary to the Amazon. And that was really beautiful to kind of feel that one with nature. 
And it was that was just the thing. Nature yeah. ruled, you know, in that place, and it all felt very powerful and spiritual. When you when you experienced the I Oscar, um, what, what was for you coming back to the real world? Let's say what's what's the biggest, like um, let's say spiritual event or message that came to your heart that you go like, okay, I'm grateful for this experience because mm -hmm. I live by that by now. There is any experience mm -hmm. you could share? Yes. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. So when you do ayahuasca, generally there are a few phases to it. Um, when uh, it's this God awful tasting potion, it feels like you're just tastes like you're just drinking rubber or something, but it's made of these, you know, the ayahuasca root and these other ingredients. Um, you start to get some psychedelics, the color and lights portion, and that's trippy and interesting, but that's not the purpose of it. That's just, I think, your brain reconfiguring itself with the spirit of the ayahuasca so it can communicate with you. Um, in the first, I, I'd done this a number of times. The first time I had that experience, then I had, I, I was somehow embodied in an ocelot walking through the jungle and i got to feel the oneness of that um but then there was something even bigger that came after that which was this stillness and this absolute connectedness with everything around me like i i felt like the answer to any question i could possibly have is right here like I'm connected to it all. And I think, uh, and that's, you know, they, the tribes used ayahuasca, not as a trippy experience. They use it as a problem solving yeah. thing where they would need to find a new water source or, or find whatever. So it's about perspective and getting the larger view and feeling the connectedness. And I do feel like we are all connected. We are connected to everything. It's the separation that's the illusion. Yeah. Interesting. Ready for another question, Brad? Yes. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Next question for you is, if you were to raise a child, what are the most important things would you like them to learn? Um, empathy. I think, you know, I, that's a big theme with me. I think it's always important to try and consider what the other person's life is like and their feelings. Um, I would want a child to learn self-acceptance about who they are and not get lost in comparing themselves to other people. Um, I would want to teach a child about nature and being in the moment and not being so tied to our phones and our apps and all of that. Um, I, of course, would want to nurture any creativity that comes out of the child and give them a chance to develop it um, without being some sort of stage mom. Um, but just to let, you know, creativity. And I would also want to teach them that, you know, this growth thing doesn't stop when you graduate college, that we are all a work in progress and that we should always be pressing outside our comfort zone to grow and learn like that's just that's just how you stay not just alive but kind of i don't know younger and more vibrant amazing next one let's do it <laughs> brad before the next one tell me yeah. about new york what do you like the most about the city and uh, what bothers you about living in new york in your opinion all right well i love um, of course, any New Yorker, you know, who loves New York will tell you when you get home from, when you come back to New York from somewhere else, even just the feeling of the walls of the building around you are comforting. Um, <laughs> and the fact that there are so many things within a stone's throw, you can, you know, you can run five errands in, in 15 minutes because it's all, you know, in that area. But what I like most about New York is the contact with people uh there's people from all walks of life fully diverse everything that you're gonna see and maybe sit next to in the subway because you're not inside your 2000 ton car on a freeway somewhere 
So it's it. I tend to have way more interesting conversations um, than I have anywhere else because people are open to it. Then when you have a beautiful um, golden retriever that you walk around the neighborhood at night, then, oh my God, then you meet so many people. And that's the thing too, like we live in Chelsea and Ch there's all these little residential neighborhoods that feel like small towns. You see the same people, you start to know the bouncers and the restaurant owners and the shopkeepers and uh, the other dogs in the neighborhood and whatever. So it has, it has a little maybe RFD feel to it, even though you're in this big, big city. And then of course we love going to theater. Um, so, you know, it's the best theater in the world. And we were so thrilled when theater came back. Um, and uh, uh, we, I mean, it's so vibrant and energizing and inspiring. On the other side of that, of course, summer's not a pleasant time. It's much better to be out here because uh, it can be hot and smelly. Um, the other night I was walking Ari there was some guy yelling at two kids that must have played a prank and he was chasing them. And there were some street people that weren't very happy. And I, I was thinking, oh, the neighborhood's kind of angry and off tonight. Like it can have those nights, you know, where the energy is not great. You know, um, homelessness is certainly a problem. And, um, uh, I don't feel like crime is a problem. I lived in New York in the early years, uh, back in 82, and and I was living in Hell's Kitchen when it was really Hell's Kitchen. And you had to watch which streets you walked down or walk in the middle of a street because you don't want somebody lurking. You know, like, it, it, it's so far away from that. Um, it's gotten so developed and upscale, um, but when you see the when you see this difference in uh, wealth, you know people who are living in these big buildings and whatever, and then you see street people who are just trying to survive. Um, you know, it's just hard. It's hard to see that. Let's see. Next question for you is: What do you like to cook the most? Oh, I love cooking. That's like a big one for me. Um, I think my favorite dinner uh, is still uh, grilled Chilean sea bass um, with either a nice mashed potatoes or a pearl couscous or maybe a rice and then some nice veg, you know, broccolini or whatever. Very simple. A lot of my cooking is just simple flavors, but I grill whenever we can out here. And then when I'm home, I cook these vegan meals that purple carrot makes they're like uh it's like a food box food service where you get three put together like it's the raw ingredients but it's shopped for you with the recipe and so we have like these really interesting meals for three or four nights a week that are vegan and we eat kind of late so actually eating the vegan is kind of helpful too and what do you like to cook that chris likes the most Well, the I'd say the Chilean sea bass, but also I do a really good pork tenderloin. That's uh, that's one of my favorites. And uh, if we do a big dinner party, or sometimes just for us, uh, pork tenderloin, just nice, you know, cook nicely, medium, uh, and um, uh, sweet potato mash, and some other nice uh, vegetable. I do uh, this. Um, Uh, actually, the the other one has this too. I do this slaw out of um, um, uh, it'll come it'll come two questions from now. There's a vegetable that I just I cut it, I shave it, and it was something a vegetable that I never liked, and then I saw it prepared this way. And whenever I make that, Chris gets really happy. Um, he he'll be on the other side of the screen going, "It's blank. How could you, how could you not remember that?" <laughs> Brad, I, I have say, three. I want to say artichokes, but it's not artichokes. It's <laughs> Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. sprouts. Yes, it's very popular here in England. People eat for Christmas. Christmas, we eat a lot. Yeah, and I hated Brussels sprouts as a kid. I cooked my Brussels sprout slaw with a little shallots in there to kind of give the sweet and savory thing. 
And Chris's nephew goes, I can't believe I'm saying this, but please pass the Brussels sprouts. I want some more. You know, it was like, it was good. Brussels sprouts. Brad, three questions left for you. Let's do okay. it. Next question for you is, if you could be in somebody's place, somebody's skin for 24 hours, who mm. that would be and why? Well, that's interesting. Because I thought about that in terms of <laughs> if I could take some of the some of my most hated politicians <laughs> and be be in their skin for a day but give them empathy and and force them to actually see mm. the effects of what they're doing and how far off they are in terms of what's really important, that would be interesting. In terms of just being somebody, like it wouldn't be a celebrity. I think while they have some fabulousness, I think their lives are really hard uh, from what I've seen in terms of being visual and famous. So if I uh, wanted to be in someone's skin for a day, I would say uh, probably like fabulous concert violinist I, I grew up playing violin as a kid it would be really beautiful to be in that level of brilliance and see what that feels like Do you play any instruments musical instrument well violin was the only one uh and actually i did i did good with that i in my acting days i got uh parts on commercials where they needed actors who could play a violin i got a big chevy commercial big commercial just because I could actually play and do the vibrato and um, and uh, and I got my first equity card production uh, for doing Fiddler on the Roof playing a fiddler who actually played not just a dancer who was miming um, but I haven't played any other instruments since I did try piano for like a minute in my 20s um, but uh, no but growing up playing violin really helps because I have to be able to communicate with composers and music editors and whatever. And that musical language is an understanding of how music works. It's still a part of me. And uh, I'm grateful for that. See. Two questions left for you. Let's do it. Brad, but before the next question, um, yeah. you know, uh, during those two years that the world was facing, still faced the COVID crisis when the world yeah. literally stopped, yeah? Yeah. For you, particularly for you, what's the biggest positive impact that brought to your personal life and um, the most negative one, if you can share? Well, the most positive impact from COVID, uh, I feel, is working remotely because technology really saved the day. Zoom, um, we do um, virtual edit sessions and sometimes my Uh, and there's there's some lag occasionally but mostly it works pretty seamlessly we can all gather in the room the main window is the avid window and we can watch the cut and we can all we all have our boxes and we can communicate and that's given us the ability to be home um to, with our doggy you know like i said taking her for a beach walk and i think that that's gonna that's gonna stay to some degree so that's a positive effect um The negative effect, I'd say, first of all, the, again, it just exacerbated the polarization, you know, that it became, nobody like politicized um, uh, smallpox or, or polio, you know, it, it, it just wasn't that. And the fact that it became a political issue because they wanted to pretend that it wasn't bad, or keep people ignorant, or just everybody should get it, and that's how we should get through it, when of course that wasn't the answer either, because now there's variants and we can get it multiple times. So um, I feel like it, it divided the country in a really uh, big way, and that was frustrating. I see, all right. Last, sorry, no, second question for you is, okay. Who, okay. who in your family you'd play, you'd trade place with, and why? Sorry, who in my, Family you would trade place with, and why? Ooh, my family. That's so funny because it's like uh, I'm the, I'm the oddball one, the anomaly that uh, <laughs> that I think uh, they would want to 
trade places with. But I guess um, my uh, niece Elizabeth, she just is a she's well. First of all, she so embodies so much of what my sister Lottie was about, and uh, she's just such a good person, such a good mom, such a good wife. She's good in business. She just. Um, she she is a lovely, beaming person, and raising a family is such a huge accomplishment, as far as I'm concerned. You know, we've raised golden retrievers, but I haven't gotten to raise a family. So, right. Ready for the last one, Brad? Sure, absolutely. Let's do it. Last one. But before the last question, people watch the interview right now. Would you like yeah. to start a career as a TV mm -hmm. producer or in TV business, television? What would be your best piece of advice for those people? Well, I think you need to, there's, I think people don't realize how many different types of producers there are. Um, there are people who foster an idea and bring it to a network and they may have producer credit. There are people who raise money for films and they have a producer credit. Um, there are people who deal with the nuts and bolts of production uh, and those are producers. And then there are people like me who do post-production. So I think it would be to educate yourself about how the business works and try and see where that niche is. I think most people don't realize how many it's, hundreds and hundreds of people who participate in making a show so it's not always going to have to be some top role uh just like when i was a kid i just thought i wanted to be an actor and that's all i wanted to be you know and then it didn't even occur to me that there were so many other ways to be creative you know i mean i'm writing um you know what i do as a producer is creative if you wanted to do post-production um i always recommend Uh, depending on where you are in your world, to try and get a job as a PA. A production assistant in post is a really good entry level position. I've actually raised people from PA all the way to post producer. Like if you show that you're good and you have an understanding and you're really into it, uh, people will give you more to do. And that's what happened to me. And that's what's happened to the people that I've raised. Um, there are... Um, harder things if you wanted to work in writing and trying to get you know a writer's assistant position is is tough but there are ways to do it uh pas is also something you can do on the production side and you can move up to assistant production coordinator production coordinator upm eventually um, when i was at sex in the city that year and i was assistant production office coordinator i looked at that chain of jobs and all the headaches and i was like yeah i don't think i want that career path so it was good that that post happened and then there's always writing your own material and trying to get it out there and then you know be a producer on that and chris and i just started our own production company at this late date um so that some of my we can support some of my writing projects but then also nurture other artists and see if we can help get them off the ground amazing Saying that, what's the um, if you could pick just one of your projects that you go like, okay, this project was something that you always have gonna have a, a special place in your mm -hmm. heart. Which one that would be? I think um, that's a hard one because Nurse Jackie was certainly I got to experience that from the pilot all the way to the final episode. I was one of the only producers that stayed through the whole process. Edie, of course, was amazing to work with. And the Nurse Jackie was an addict and it was a really good addict story. Um, and uh, a lot of people, you know, hold that show close to their heart, hearts. More recently, I would say um, uh, Fosse Verdon. Fosse Verdon, because It, it was about Bob Fosse and Gwen Verdon and their partnership and also the fact that the Gwen Verdon wasn't acknowledged a lot of times. Like Bob Fosse was the big name, but she was a real creative impulse and collaborator with him. Um, and it harkened back to my own acting days in my 20s. And in fact, when I was and I was working with such great people, Tommy Kale, who directed Hamilton and Lin-Manuel Miranda and Stephen Levinson 
who did uh, Dear Evan Hansen, um, uh, Joe Fields, who was, uh, you know, on The Americans, and uh, such talented people and such good people. Um, and so they liked the fact that I had uh, acting days in my past, that I was out there when Bob Fosse was still a, a, a name on Broadway. And uh, so recreating some really momentous, like uh, the movie Cabaret, like recreating some of those scenes was just great. And the Pippin stuff, always loved that show. And we had a whole trippy Pippin thing. And then we even had this meta thing where... Um, Bob Fosse, you know, was doing all that jazz. And um, we had access to all the family stuff. So we were, you know, when we see show him recording notes to himself about all that jazz, we have those actual recordings. So we even got close to the family. Uh, it was like, never have I ever gotten so close to a legacy that means so much. And that's why I was thrilled to get to go to the Emmys with all of them. To, just to celebrate the show. It was really good. Amazing. Last question for you is... Yeah. Right. I think this one, it might be a bit tricky, but let's see. If not, we can yeah. change. Okay. What is the best first date have we ever been on? <laughs> well, that's not tricky. That's The best first date I've ever been on is, is the first date with Chris. We, um, you know, we had met at the gym in a relatively wholesome way, I will say. We saw each other in the locker room and we spoke with, that's a whole story. Um, but I, I, I'll just focus on the date. So, um, we exchanged cards, we made plans, uh, to, uh, meet up for a date, uh, the ne following week, uh, I decided to cook him dinner at my apartment, which is a ballsy move, but I'm like, this is just me. This is where I was in my life. I'm just me. I'm just being me and I love to cook and, um, okay. So he came over, um, he was so worried about what to wear and what catchy shirt and this and that and the other, and I had been vacuuming. So I came to the door, uh, in a pair of jeans and shirtless and votive candles lit everywhere. And he was just like, oh, and, um, that night, um, we didn't plan it this way, but it ended up being a princess dies funeral. Oh, so this was, that's when this happened. You know, we met the week before it was Labor Day and then the accident happened. And then that was the night of the funeral. We've been talking about it during the week. So we, I fixed him dinner. This was the chili and sea bass dinner um, <laughs> that became so famous. And um, we just connected so beautifully. We heard each other and shared stuff with each other. Um, you know, we had our lovely meal. Um, and um, we, you know, we, you know, we had sex for a while and then uh, we were going to, the, the funeral was like in the middle of the night. So we, so we get um, to watch the uh, funeral and it's the procession and it's another 30 minutes till they get to um, uh, Westminster Abbey. So Chris was like, let's go finish. And then we can come back and watch the funeral. So of course, after all of that, we're watching the funeral and we had been talking about Elton John and his special lyrics to Candle in the Wind. And so we get to the song and he's asleep on my shoulder. Oh. And I just went, hey, it's the song. And I just woke him up so that he could hear the song. And that night was so typical of the home nights that we've had ever since that we so treasure. I'll cook us a nice meal. We'll watch something that we're into on TV and we'll hang out and we'll sit on the couch and hold hands. You know, I mean, it's just the sweetest thing. And this has been going on for almost 25 years, you know, from that first date. From that, from that first date that you just described right now, from that yeah. moment that he shared on the interview when you proposed to him in Provincetown, town, how <laughs> I just loved it. Most beautiful he's describing. <laughs> how long did it take from this beautiful date until that moment that you proposed to him? Well, it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't that long because this was in September, early September, 
when I proposed to him, we were living in P-Town the following summer. I think it was August of 98. We met, you know, uh, around Labor Day 97 and it was like August 98. So it was really soon. It's just that we had been living together in Provincetown, this magical, beautiful place. And everything was working so well that I just couldn't imagine not being with him. And, uh, and so, yes, then I, yeah, I want, I want to marry you. And his response, why are you laying all this on me now? And, uh, it was, you know, it took some time. We just, we knew we were going to eventually get married. It just took, it just took us, uh, 11 years to get around to getting married. Um, what's the biggest similarity between both of you, Brad? What's the biggest difference in your opinion? Um, we, yeah, we always talk about relationships being either a fit or a match. A fit if you have various differences that somehow work together. A match is when you're very similar. And we are so similar. Um, we think alike. We tend to complete each other's sentences. You know, like he'll say two words and I'll absolutely know and jump ahead to the answer. Uh, that drove people crazy when we worked together because we would have a whole conversation and they didn't even know what we said because it was like, I bet, do -do -do -do. okay, all right, got it. You know, um, uh, I would say our, our differences, it's interesting because we divide up the things that we like doing for the relationship. Like he arranges all our travel. He is, he's great at getting his theater tickets. If it weren't for him, we wouldn't do half the stuff that we do. I, on the other hand, am just try to be impeccable about maintaining the apartment, the reef. We have a saltwater reef tank. You know, we have a, a pet that needs constant attention. Things, fixing things in the apartment, Mr. Fix It. Um, I'm good at those kinds of things. He's not as good at that just because he's not as familiar with it because I do it all the time. But then when I show him how to do stuff, he immediately knows how to do it. So um, I, I would say I tend to be more mindful of his state of mind and what he's going through and what he may need. And he quite honestly said on your interview with him that there are times that I would think that he's still too self-centered and maybe a little oblivious to things. And I was like, wow, nailed it. And he was, I'm like, oh, self-aware. Good for you. Just the <laughs> fact that he knows that I might think, because, you know, it's the nature of things. We are who we are. Um, he's a very caring, loving person, but he just gets caught up in, uh, in what he's going through. And, um, you know, so, yeah, anyway. Sweet, yeah. very sweet, very sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Let's play now the word association game, okay? I'm going to give away some words. Just tell me one word that comes to your mind. Quick thinking, okay? Okay. So, I hope you are enjoying the interview. Before we do the word association game, don't forget to give a like, don't forget to share this video, and also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Just click on the bottom right there. Thank you so much, and enjoy the word association game. Okay. Money. Uh, <laughs> um, necessary. Family. Everything. Love. Also everything. Sex. Important. Connection. Exciting. Life. A journey. Politics. Frustrating. Religion. Also frustrating. Fear. Uh, permeates everything. Friendship. Really rare and must be cherished. Desire. Im uh, important but not in an all-consuming way. Regrets. Mm, 
times I wasn't in the moment. Success? Love in my life. Wish? The, for the world to get its act together. Happiness? Most of the days in my life. One word for you, New York City. Metropolis. <laughs> One word for Provincetown. Charming. It is. I've been there once. Last time I went to the US, I've been there and I was like, wow, that's something special. There's a, pl a special place. Such a special place. There's nothing like it. And this last week we were in P-Town and every single day, every single event was like top notch. It felt like the town just looked after us in every possible way. Um, uh, it's like, and, and it's, it's uh, consistent. It's, uh, there are some things in P-Town that never changed that are just the way we remember it from that summer in 98 you know the red in is the red in bubblers is bubble you know the 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 way the town looks and feels you know they keep it they maintain that balance there somehow it's really good really one good. word for usa divided one word for i want i want sorry I, your the, the state where you were born, Iowa, Iowa. I, I, Iowa. Um, Iowa. Yes. Uh, um, uh, corn basket. <laughs> <laughs> they grow a lot of corn. <laughs> And the last one now, TV producer. One word. Negotiator. Hmm. Interesting. Let's pretend I'm going to meet Chris for a coffee and I'm going to ask Chris. Chris, define bread in one positive word and one negative word only. What he would say? Um, he would say that uh, I'm an optimist. That's a good thing. And um, he would say that I don't sometimes i just don't express my feelings when they're happening they build up and then they come out at once right let's play now brad and the magic box and you can yes. ask me a question okay brad you can ask me a question now in all of, you've interviewed people all over the world on all of these topics And you do it so frequently. What motivates you to do this incredible work of interviewing? Really, you're you're, you're doing all of these uh, different perspectives. What what motivates you to do it? Good question. I think, Brad, it's uh, the motivation is to see how people they are so interesting you know uh connect with people around the world and see at the same time we are so different but at the same time as well we are so similar like you know people sharing their life stories people getting emotional people getting angry sometimes like yeah. when they, when they talk about certain topic mm -hmm. people getting you know uh, uh sharing their lives i think for me the fact that i'm able to connect with All those people, you have no idea. I was talking to a friend the other day and I told him, my God, my knowledge of my, even myself to get to know myself. There are so mm -hmm. many topics that for me, it was very difficult to understand or I wasn't into it. But now talking to people, my mind just opened up, you know, people talking about relationship, people talking about certain topics that for me um and maybe i just was interested in or maybe yeah. was something that i was so for me it's like oh my god it's so interesting to hear mm -hmm. other people express themselves mm -hmm. so for me i think the main thing that about the show that makes me so excited it's about people sharing their lives and let them connect with the world and also be themselves I think people, when they are talking to me, I can see that they forget that they are recording. They forget that yeah. we are we're just connecting. And it's yeah. so beautiful to see people being themselves. Yeah. I think that's the most 
grateful part of the, the, the job of the, the magic box because people, I think nowadays we live in a world now that's, you know, things need to be so per, about perfectionist, being per, perfect, this and that. And when you see somebody from the other side, just literally being themselves for me, yep. it's just my job is done because I think people, they, they express themselves in a way that's sometimes they don't do every day and just the fact that they feel comfortable talking to me and sharing yeah. their lives i think for me it's the biggest gift and it just keeps mm -hmm. me going because it's something beautiful and unique as well so mm -hmm. it, it's just amazing that's the, the the main reason that keeps me like you know doing that because it just seeing people smiling crying sometimes yeah. or maybe you know what I mean? Challenge themselves with some topics. Mm -hmm. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's just amazing, and yeah. see other people connect with each other as well. Yeah. It's just yeah. amazing. It's just so beautifully amazing. So yeah, that's the main reason about the magic box, and just see beautiful, interesting people like you sharing their lives. <laughs> that's beautiful. Well, I think all the polarization and everything we were talking about. I think the magic box is and answer for that because the more we can understand who people are in their own lives and not see them as other and and just different they're all just people with loves and fears and you know goals and regrets and you know just trying to make it all work absolutely and i think it's when they express themselves and i think it's like they are free something they are putting out something that maybe yes. they didn't feel you know what i mean just they're talking like they're literally uh, you know, put something out of their chest that uh, mm -hmm. maybe they didn't feel like, uh, you know, doing before, or maybe they just uh, are repeating again. It just feel yeah. nice and free, and it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Brad, did you enjoy the interview? Oh, I loved it. Thank you. <laughs> what a treat. I must, I must say something to you. I look, I when I see Chris posting like uh, things about you uh, together, like both of you. You have no idea how many times I, ma I made comments with friends around my circle, like about you both, because it's so beautiful to see two handsome guys, you know, sharing a life, sharing so much love, like, you know what I mean? It's so beautiful. And I go like, I would like to have a relationship like that one day, you know what I mean? That's, it's like, a, it's like, it's so beautiful to see both of you, you know what I mean? Like uh, sharing a life and uh, having this, you know, the gay scene, is, it, it's, it's, my God, 25 years, it's like, wow. I know, that's like 250 <laughs> years in gay years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. But before you go, um, uh, Chris, you see, I'm calling you Chris Yeah, yeah, now. yeah, see? I don't feel good <laughs> Brad, time. before you go, let's, let's pretend that you have now the whole world watching you, connect with you right now, and you have a microphone, and you could uh, tell a message to the whole world right now, what would you say? I would say that we are more the same than we are different. And the differences we have, we need to learn to appreciate those differences and we need to understand each other better because it's going to take all of us working together to save this planet. and. For those of you with children and grandchildren, you're going to want to have a planet for those folks. And climate change is a real problem. We're witnessing it now. Um, this diverse, this polarization that we're all going through, it's not just in the United States, it's really happening in other parts of the world. This is a tough time for the planet and for the people trying to survive on this planet. We're going to have to pull together if we're gonna make it through. So um, try not to judge, try not to assume, and try to remember that we're all people just trying to make a good life for ourselves. Absolutely, absolutely. Brad, such a pleasure to connect with you. Thank you so much regarding to Chris and you keep in touch, okay? It was a pleasure. Yes, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> Thank you so much, this was a lot of fun. Amazing. Take care, okay? Enjoy your weekend. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Bye, bye bye. Bye. So, did you like the show? Don't forget to give a like, to share it, and also don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to be part of the show as well, first, subscribe to our channel, and after that, just go to our website 
www.williamandthemagicbox.com and send us a request saying why would you like to be part of the show. And I'll see you there. Bye-bye. See you next time.